listen to a very good friend of mine who I've known for, as we determined this weekend, over 18 years. And I've uh, come across our paths many times and across the country at many conferences and just as good friends uh, in terms of the her herbal world and in terms of just life in general. So again, we were friends immediately, have been for a long time, and I was really excited because Chen Chow came to Seven Springs for the American Herbalist Guild annual conference, which was held uh, just this past weekend. And so when I knew she was coming, she had, hey, she had not been to the... Uh, store for 15 years and been to West Virginia and so we thought wait hey, what the heck you know so she came and we cooked up this idea to do a, a program tonight and I'm gonna let her tell a little bit about her story but uh, we're gonna be talking about you know the pharmacy that's in your kitchen cupboard that you don't know existed that has been as you can probably well know we see in the media a lot today that there's a lot of uh, talk about some of these common spices like cinnamon and ginger and basil and oregano and and you know we're going to talk about that tonight and let her share her knowledge and she's a wealth of knowledge and we don't have to limit it so we let her do a presentation we will have question answer and you can hold those questions until we get done that'll be great and we'll have plenty of time to you know and she can talk about other things too so hey don't it has to be just in our kitchen cupboard but without further ado this is Chen Chao Cabrera. Thank you, David. And thank you all for coming out on such a lovely evening. I'm sure you would like to be on your porch. I just did a walk around the block, and there's a whole lot of people out there enjoying the, uh, the sunset and the, and the warm air. Um, yeah, I have been here before, but I wouldn't recognize David's shop, I've got to say, 15 years. It's um, grown and changed a lot. So um, I want to thank David and Mother um, Earth Foods for bringing me here, and thank you also to the church for hosting this. It's a privilege to be here. The last time I stood up in front of a church, I was actually giving the sermon in our church at home, and I was a lot more nervous doing that. So I think we're going to be okay tonight. So um, very briefly, I come from, well, you can probably hear the accent, right? I'm actually British originally, but I've been living in Canada since 1988. Um, on Vancouver Island, uh, most recently. I, uh, anybody here been to Vancouver Island? <laughs> that was David saying yes. Um, it's winter there already, so I'm really happy to be here because we've had our first winter storms, we had a, trees down, the, I live on an island, so when we have a big storm, the ferries close off, and so I was glad to be away. Um, so, very brief introduction of myself. I've been a medical herbalist for 27 years. I have a four-year undergraduate degree and a three-year Master of Science in Herbal Medicine. That was at the University of Wales. Um, I've been a clinician, um, seeing patients in practice all of that time. The last 10 years specializing mostly in cancer care and holistic oncology. But uh, I also teach a lot about herbs all over the country, but in particular in Vancouver, there's a naturopathic medicine school, so I run the herbal medicine program there. And in my own home, I, uh, I teach a lot of classes and I practice a lot of what I preach, most particularly in the kitchen. So this year, I was very lucky to have a live-in chef. Um, I don't know quite how that happened, but I'm very grateful. We have a lot of interns that live with us through the season on the farm to learn about holistic agriculture, and um, it's a lot of work to cook for them. So having the chef was great, and he and I started a whole series of classes called Food is Medicine. And so I'm going to pick up tonight just a little bit on some of those topics. Just before I dive in, though, I wanted to mention, David talked about the genetic modification awareness campaign and um, letting you know about the fact that there's a concern about genetic engineering. And I just wanted to let you know, my husband is a retired soil scientist. He worked for Agriculture Canada for 30 years um, as a plant disease specialist and a soil scientist. In the last 10 years of his career, he was a genetic engineer and actually traveled the world as the Canadian government spokesperson for genetic engineering. And when we first met, he had retired, but he was still um, pretty pro-GM. And uh, over the years of our marriage, I guess I've worked on him enough that he went back to do the research. And he found a lot of new research that wasn't available when he was in the profession. And he now travels all over the country with a presentation about the dangers and risks of genetic engineering. And let me tell you, it's very scary. 
So um, I could give that talk and it would be all fear-mongering and emotions and I'd talk about frankenfoods and some people would be excited and, and, and some people would just be turned off because I wouldn't have the, um, the, the sort of seriousness that my husband brings to it. But because he's a PhD soil scientist and spent 10 years promoting this to now go around the country saying, you know what, it's very dangerous. It's a very um, significant um, problem in our culture because it's so, as David pointed out, it's not labeled. So you don't have a choice. It's not an opportunity for you to make informed decisions there. You're just being fed stuff that you don't know what it's going to do to you because actually nobody knows what it's going to do to you yet. Um, so yes, we are part of a big experiment and I personally choose not to participate. We grow most of our own food and harvest our own seeds, which of course the big corporations would rather we didn't. Um, but that way we know that what we're eating is not genetically engineered and I feel a little bit more comfortable with that. So I just wanted to let you know that it isn't just a bunch of radical old hippies, you know, getting upset about something that's kind of silly. It's actually, a, you know, scientists are also concerned. So, that said, let's talk about more cheerful topics. Let's talk about um, kitchen pharmacy or food as medicine. Or how many of you grow a few herbs in your garden? How many of you use herbs in your kitchen? All right, good. So hopefully most of what I say to you tonight is going to make you think about what you already have at home. You actually don't have to go to a herbalist to get care, although of course perhaps I shouldn't say that because you know I'm in the profession of healing, but nonetheless, Herbal medicine is, um, in some ways, it's the most democratic system of medicine there is. It is really for the people, of the people, and by the people. You actually do herbal medicine every day. How many of you made a cup of tea today? Or made a pot of coffee? Okay, so you already made a herbal medicine today. Yeah. How many of you drank a glass of wine? Or a beer? How many of you ate pizza with tomatoes on it? Yeah, I knew they did, because we shared it. So, so that's all medicine. You know, you can go into the store and purchase lycopene in capsules, or you can eat tomatoes. Ideally with a little bit of oil, because that compound likes to be absorbed with oil. So to maximize the nutritional value of your pizza, you want the cheese, or at least some olive oil, or some olives, or something like that. So we're already doing herbal medicine every single day. When you eat, when you drink, you're already making choices about ingesting health food, nutrient value food, as opposed to junk food. So it isn't really necessary um, always to go and buy products or consult with practitioners or take products, capsules and tinctures, although obviously in a health um, problem, if you, if you do have an actual disease, then you may need more than just what your food can provide. But I think the point is that if we make good choices about our food and incorporate the medicines into our diet, we may not need to go and seek health care as often. So um, Hippocrates, two and a half thousand years ago, he said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And that adage is just as valid and relevant today as it was way back. So we're going to talk about a number of different fairly common herbs and spices, things that I would expect that you would have in your kitchen or could easily access and perhaps even grow. Some of them are tropical, you're not going to grow them, but some of them are very common, easy garden plants. So we're going to talk about those things that I hope you'll go away feeling a little bit empowered that you can actually go home and do this right away. So, um, David, could we get the first, please? I don't have access to my computer here. I have to call for the slide changes. So the first plant we're going to talk about is sage. Like your sage and onion, stuffing sage, that kind of sage. If you're out in the Midwest, there's another plant that they do call sage, and it's completely unrelated. This is culinary or kitchen sage. And I do have... It, the print is a little bit small, um, but the name, the Latin name is up there. The Latin name is Salvia officinalis. Now, anytime you see the name officinalis on a plant or officinale, 
What that means is that it was already being used as a medicine back in the, um, in the 1700s when Linnaeus started to name all the plants. So before Linnaeus, there were obviously plants had names, but they had different names in different parts of the country or in different countries. There was no consistency. It made it very hard for herbalists to talk to each other outside of their own little village because they didn't always know which plants they were referring to. So Linnaeus came along, Carlos Linnaeus, and he named plants and animals, and more than that, he created a classification system. And any plant that was already widely used as a medicine in his day was given the name official. It's an official plant, so it's officinale or officinalis. So any time you're reading names of herbs and you see that, you know it's been a medicine for at least 300 years and probably a lot longer. So the first part of the name salvia comes from the root word salvare, meaning to save, salvation. And there's a nice little saying, a little phrase about sage, which goes, why should a man die while sage grows in his garden? And what that really refers to is that it is a great salvation herb. It is good for lots and lots of different things. Let's have the next picture, David. Um, and let's go one more. I think I have a close-up next. Yeah. So for those of you who are botanists or gardeners, um, this is in the mint family. It has the classically bilateral symmetry to the flower, only one place that you can cut it to get two equal halves. That's very significant in that family. And if you're growing sage, there are many, many cultivars now. There's all kinds of scented varieties and colored varieties. For a medical herbalist, the one we like best is the purple-leafed sage, Salvia officinalis variety purpurea, the purple leaf sage. Or it has more of the pigments, and every time that you see pigment, every time you see red or purple in a plant, you have an antioxidant value. So it's best to eat purple cabbage rather than white cabbage, purple plums rather than white plums, the pink uh, watermelon, not the yellow watermelon. And with the sage, if you go to the purple-leafed sage, it has more antioxidant value. Why does that matter? Well, we're all hunting down antioxidants like crazy these days because that's the anti-aging stuff. So we age by oxidative stress. That is how our cells age. Rusting is actually oxidation. So you could kind of say that we rust to death. So we're always seeking for antioxidants in our diet and, of course, in supplements because they actually promote longevity, not necessarily living to 150 years, but living well so that the years pass, but we don't degrade as much with the time passing. So. In your kitchen, if you bring sage in as a culinary spice, culinary herb, you're actually bringing in a little bit of antioxidant value right there. But there's more to it than that. There are some other very interesting attributes. Sage is a um, antiseptic herb. The mint family in general have a lot of essential oils or volatile oils. And those oils are usually somewhat antiseptic. Now, sage has a particular um, preference for working in the mouth. So it's very, very useful if you've had any kind of dental work done, or you have gum disease, or you bit your tongue really badly, or you've got a sore throat, tonsillitis, laryngitis, something like that. You want to actually make a tea out of the sage and then rinse with it, rinse the mouth with it. You can swallow it afterwards, it's fine. Um, or you can spit it out, it doesn't really matter. When you're making those herbal teas, because it's the essential oils that you're trying to get out, you want to steep it with a lid on because essential oils are volatile. They come off in the steam. So if you just let that out in the room, it might smell nice, but you're losing your medicine. If you put a lid on, so steep it in a pot, teapot with a lid or a saucepan with a lid on, then the steam will condense inside the lid and drop back into the cup, into the water, and then you're getting that medicine. Otherwise, it's dissipated into the air. So if you have sage in your garden, you could just grab a handful of leaves, a half a dozen leaves, chop them up small, pour on a cup or so of boiling water, put the lid on, leave it steep for 10, 15 minutes, and then rinse and gargle with that. You could actually use it as a skin wash for mild, minor skin infections as well. You've got a little bit of a dirt in a cut or something. You can wash it out with sage. 
The other thing that's particularly interesting about sage, different to any other plant, is that it is very cooling and very drying. And it is particularly useful as a cool tea for menopausal hot flashes. It's slightly, slightly estrogen balancing, not really significant factor, but just a little bit estrogen balancing, and it's very cooling and quite drying. That means it dries up excess perspiration. So not just menopausal hot flashes, but if you're someone who has sweaty feet, sweaty hands, you're just, you know, a bit of a perspiring type, then you may want to dry up a little bit um, by using the sage tea. You can make tinctures, you can get capsules, but the tea is very readily accessible for you. It's an, how many of you have sage at home? Yeah. So there you go, a few uses for it. I think I have one more picture, David. Yeah. I really encourage you, if you are interested in the plants, to invest in a little hand lens. They're 10 or $15 in a camera store. And they're really nice to have a little magnifying glass to look closely at the plants. They really are incredibly beautiful. And we tend to just walk through the garden and say, oh, look, that's quite nice, isn't it, and walk past. I really encourage you to stop and take out your little hand lens and get up close and personal and get to know those plants because they're so, so beautifully put together, just designed for the job. This is perfectly designed for that bee to climb in there, get the nectar out, pollinate as it goes. So that's sage. Let's look at one more slide, David. No prizes for guessing what this is. This is garlic. Now, garlic is an interesting herb. Um, you either love it or you hate it. I happen to love it. But I do know people that don't, and so we have to work around that. We use other herbs instead of garlic for some folks. But I'm going to tell you the trick of how to take garlic as a medicine and still keep your friends. And when I say as a medicine, I actually do mean in really therapeutic doses. I'm going to tell you a little story about my husband. He, um, when we first got together, he took up swimming. And he was going to the local pool, and he got an ear infection. And it got pretty bad. He, um, he didn't tell me, so I didn't get to do anything until it got pretty bad. And he ended up going to ER at about 3 o'clock in the morning with ghastly ear pain. And it really, I mean, head in hand, moaning sort of pain. And they gave him an antibiotic, which didn't work at all. So a couple of weeks later, he's back at the ER, at which point they got him in to see an e ear, nose, and throat specialist who said, oh, well, the antibiotic didn't work because you have a fungal infection. And uh, here, take this antifungal, which didn't work at all. So finally, we're now about three weeks into it, and he's pretty miserable. And he finally said, you know what? You're a herbalist. Can you help? And I'm like, oh, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> so my prescription to him, and bless him, he's a very, very compliant patient. My prescription to him was garlic, not in the ear, but, but taken orally. And I asked him to take a head of garlic twice a day. And yes, you did hear that correctly. It was a head of garlic twice a day. And the way he did it, and he did it every day for a month, and it completely cleared it up. He, um, he, and this is what I recommend to you again to keep your friends. You chop the garlic small. You put it on a spoon. I don't recommend a head to most of my patients. They're not going to do that. But a clove or two, if I think I'm getting a cold or if I'm going to be flying and exposed to other people's germs and what have you, I'll take a clove or two for several days in a row. You chop it up small. You put it on a spoon and you put it to the back of your throat and swallow it with liquid of some sort, juice or whatever, without chewing. If you chew it, all those oils in the garlic go in the pores of your mouth and you taste it for the next few days and all your friends know about it. But if you just swallow it down, especially if you do that at bedtime, it might repeat on you once or twice in the night. Nobody's going to know. Maybe get your partner to do it as well. And in the morning, it's just fine. You don't smell of garlic. It's very tolerable. Some people have a sensitive stomach. They might want to have a little bit of something starchy, a bite or two of bread or cracker or something so that you don't have raw garlic on the stomach lining. It can be a little irritating. But in principle, that's an easy way to take it. Just one other little quirky thing about taking garlic is that, you know, if you peel a clove of garlic, it doesn't smell that strong. It's not until you cut it that you really get the strong smell. And that is because the 
um, active compound in garlic is not active until it's had exposure to air. So you need to chop up your garlic and set it aside for 10 minutes before taking it as a medicine, even before putting it in your cooking. And you'll get more medicinal value. It literally needs, there's an enzyme that is activated by exposure to oxygen and it converts the, the compound in the garlic to its active form. So chop it up, set it aside, chop up the rest of your veggies for the spaghetti sauce. By the time you're ready for cooking, your garlic will be ready. It will be more medicinal. The other thing is a little bit like sage. It's the essential or volatile oils in the garlic that we're looking for. So if you put them in your spaghetti and the house smells fantastic and everyone comes in, oh, what's for dinner, mum? It smells great. Well, guess what? It's all out there in the kitchen in the air instead of in the food. So you want to put your garlic in the, in the pan, put the lid on so that you capture all those volatile compounds so that they condense again inside the lid, drop back into the sauce. Yeah. Now, there's a few other things you can do with garlic, other ways of taking it. I mean, in our house, we actually consider garlic to be a vegetable. It's not a condiment. So we will regularly roast garlic and eat that as a vegetable, as a side dish. And I've been known to eat three or four heads in one sitting. Um, you definitely taste of that afterwards. But you know what? It's totally worth it. Um, but the other thing I like to do with garlic is I make honeys and I make vinegars and I make oils. So I'll peel the cloves, just cut them in half, not chopped up small, cut them in half, put them in a clean jelly jar, canning jar, and then put on either an apple cider vinegar or olive oil or honey. And I often put other things in there with my honeys. I'll put some cayenne peppers, whole chilies. I'll put sage leaves sometimes. I'll put peel, like lemon peel, strips of lemon peel. All kinds of spices and stuff go in there. And then you just set it aside for a couple of weeks. And the sugar in the honey pulls the juices out of the garlic. So the garlic kind of shrivels. The honey thins a little bit. And then you've got this amazing honey for marinades and salad dressings and sauces. And at the end, you've got this garlic, which is sort of slightly sweet, and you can put that into the cooking as well. The same with the vinegar, the same with the olive oil. Vinegars we do heat up um, to boiling point before pouring over. Olive oil, you don't have to do anything. Just pour it over your, your garlic. And you don't really have to sterilize everything either because the garlic's not sterile in itself. So as long as you're keeping it in the fridge, use it up within a, two or three weeks, you should be just fine. Um, a couple of quirky things about garlic. We grow a huge amount of garlic. My husband and I have a seven-acre organic farm on, British, on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. We run a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. So we have people that purchase shares um, in the farm every year, and they get a box of food every week for 20 weeks. So this year we grew 2,500 heads of garlic. That was down from 3,000 last year. Our climate is so damp that we have to rotate it through the beds. You can't go back to the same bed for four years because there's a fungus that will come in. And once it's in, you can't get rid of it. So we've had a lot of experience growing garlic. And one of the things that I've learned, which quite amazed me, quite surprised me, is that garlic has been cultivated for so long that it no longer is able to reproduce um, by the normal means of flowering. So the picture there, you're looking at that thinking, oh, that's a pretty garlic flower. Well, let me tell you, that's a false flower. There's no sexual parts in there. There's no male and female. Your garlic clones itself. So when that flower opens inside, on the right-hand side, that, that's the, um, the flower head, so to speak, that will open up and inside there are little tiny bulbils, like miniature garlic bulbs. Have any of you seen those? Have you let your garlic get to that point? You can actually pick these scapes, as they're called, these flowering heads, when they're young and tender. You can stir fry them. You can pickle them. They're really good pickled. Um, but if you let them go to flower, what you'll get is lots and lots of tiny, tiny, tiny little garlic cloves. And yes, those can be planted. They're a clone of the parent, and they take about three years to reach maturity and give you another full bulb underground. But if you're in the business of growing garlic, that's the way you do it, because it's expensive to buy heads of garlic to plant into the ground. It's very expensive. So you take the time 
to grow out the little bulbils and plant those. So it's a false flower, it's not a real flower, kind of tricking us all. Yeah. So let's look at the next slide, David. All right, now you probably can't see that title very well. This is Rosemary. Again, it's an officinalis, so it's been a medicine a long time. Ros marinus is the Latin name, Ros marinus officinalis. Ros means dew, and marinus means of the sea. So this is a Mediterranean plant that grows on the cliff sides around the Mediterranean, and a lot of its water is actually from the dew. It doesn't actually need a lot of water in your garden. In fact, it doesn't like water. You have to grow it in a fairly dry, sandy kind of soil. Let's have the next picture, David. I've got some nice close-ups of this one. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. So, rosemary, one of my favorite plants. I, um, I'm just about to reorder. I had 120 rosemary bushes that died last winter in the cold. So um, they were four years old and they were about three foot high and I was very distressed. So I'm going to try again. I've got a new bed in the south side of the garden now where hopefully they'll be a little bit more protected because it is a Mediterranean plant and I live far enough north that it didn't like the, the cold nights. So Shakespeare wrote about rosemary. He, called it, he said, rosemary for remembrance. And that is still how we use rosemary. By and large, it's used for increasing circulation to the brain. So it literally sends blood to the head. So if you have any kind of memory loss, whether that's just because you're a student trying to memorize too much, or because you've got um, some kind of dementia, maybe you've had some kind of brain injury that's caused some memory loss, anything that you want to get more, more brain power, really. It's also useful for a number of related conditions like tinnitus, that's ringing in the ears, um, a number of eye conditions um, where there's impaired circulation to the eye, even certain types of headaches, the kinds of headaches that have a tight band around the head like a constrictive feeling, maybe you feel a bit chilly, those would be a good indication for using rosemary. Like the sage, it's in the mint family. Like the sage and the garlic, it has all those essential oils. So when you're making your tea, you want to keep the lid on, make sure you capture the steam. Um, and again, you can use rosemary um, to, to put into honeys, oils, vinegars. All of these aromatic herbs actually can be extracted into those mediums very, very nicely to make a food product for your kitchen. But of course, if you have access to a rosemary plant, you can just go pick a branch and pull the leaves off and chop them up and put them into your dishes. Um, rosemary is extremely antioxidant, so much so that extracts of rosemary are now being used in the food industry as a preservative. Because a lot of our preservatives, BHT, BHA, they're very toxic. And so the food industry is responsive to the public demand. And as we get more and more educated about the importance of clean, healthy foods, the food industry, to some extent, pays attention. And rosemary extract is something that is sort of on the rise now. Certainly in the natural food industry, it's being used quite a bit as a preservative. Um, and the only caution I would tell you, David, let's look at one more picture here. Yeah. The only caution I would suggest to you with rosemary is that because it sends blood to the head, if you have high blood pressure or if you have the kind of headaches that are expanding when your head is going to blow open, maybe you're flushed, maybe your eyes are a bit bloodshot, that's not a good indication for rosemary. You don't want more blood up there. If you've got high blood pressure, you might end up with headaches. And if you have headaches, you might make them worse. That aside, it's a considered a very safe herb. Now what I didn't say about sage and rosemary, let's have one more slide, David. Yeah, a real close up. What I didn't say about the sage and the rosemary both is that in that mint family, where they have all those volatile or essential oils, those oils also tend to be very helpful at settling down the digestive system. There's a word for that in herbal medicine. You know, we love jargon. We have a word for everything. And the word is carminative, C-A-R, carminative. What that means is herbs which are rich in volatile oils, which help the 
muscles of the gut to coordinate and regulate. So the long muscles and the circular muscles around the gut need to be coordinated so that food and gas moves smoothly through the system and doesn't build up and cause uncomfortable symptoms of bloating and colic and so on. So all of the mint family, including the sage, including the rosemary, and mint itself, of course, are very, very useful at soothing the digestive system, soothing and smoothing the digestive system. So if you're vulnerable to indigestion, gas, bloating, belching, then you're going to want to take these in your diet because they will help to facilitate the nice, smooth, onward movement of your foods. Okay, one more. Moving fast and furious here. I have a lot of slides and never enough time. I'm notorious in the conferences for not getting through my material, but I will tonight. So this is oats. Mm -hmm. So it isn't only about herbs. Your kitchen pharmacy includes a lot of basic foodstuffs. I mean, we could be up here talking about the honey and the vinegar as the medicines. I'm choosing to focus on the herbs a bit more. But oats, definitely. I mean, apart from the fact that I'm originally from Scotland, I do actually think porridge is pretty good for you. <laughs> but not necessarily the rolled oats, the instant oatmeal, because those have been processed. So the grain has been cooked and then um, dried using heat, and that damages a number of the compounds. So you break down your vitamin E, you break down your B vitamins, you start to lose nutritional value the more you process it. So in Scotland, what we do is to make our porridge is we use steel-cut oats, or what we call oat groats which is the whole grain chopped up small, looks like grits. And you have to soak that overnight, and then it cooks up just as quickly as your instant oatmeal. Um, how many of you have used steel-cut oats to make porridge? Okay, I'm preaching to the choir. Definitely, you all know this one. It's definitely more nutritious. It's also tastier. It has a n nice, rich, nutty flavor. So there's two medicines in the oats. There's actually the, the, um, the stalk or the straw, and then there's the grain. So the stalks or the straw, oat straw, is used as a connective tissue building agent. So for bones and cartilage and muscles and ligaments and skin and hair, that's all connective tissue. And the oat straw helps to build connective tissue and knit it tight together. So if you've got broken bones or torn muscles or, um, or lesions on the skin or weak falling hair, you can use oat straw for that. The grain is a little bit different. Now, having said that porridge is good medicine, I have to give you the little caveat that the really good medicine is from the immature grain. We call them green milky oats, and it's the uh, picture in the bottom right is the green milky oats in the field. So they're immature, they're still a green husk, it hasn't ripened off to that nice warm tan color. And if you squeeze it, you get a milky fluid out, which will dissipate as the, as the grain matures. That is the most potent medicine when it's picked in that immature form. And what it really does, I would say perhaps that it is food for the nervous system. It's a tonic for the nervous system. So if you're someone who gets overwrought and upset and agitated, then it will calm you down. But if you're someone who's depressed and really kind of low outlook and loss of motivation, loss of enthusiasm, it will pick you up. So it has this wonderful balancing property in the mood and the nervous function. If you can't get to sleep because you're really agitated or if you can't get up in the morning and get out of bed, you've got no will or energy to get up, either way it's going to help to balance the nervous system and balance the nervous energy. And um, it's very cheap, it's readily available, um, and if you can't get the green milky oats, then again, you can use good quality oatmeal, steel-cut oats, and you'll get some of the same effect. It's not as potent as the immature grain, but it still works to some extent. And um, there has been some controversy and concern about gluten in oats. The current understanding is that there's actually no gluten in oats, but people who are sensitive to gluten still may have a crossover sensitivity. So some people who cannot eat gluten can eat oats. 
and some can't, and that's just a matter of you needing to experiment a little bit. There's actually no gluten as such in oatmeal, but there's some crossover reactions that people get nonetheless. Okay, one more slide. This is time. And I guess what I would say, first of all, is that everything I say about time, you could pretty much say about oregano as well. Um, I could have put the oregano slides up, I ended up with time. Both of them in the mint family, both full of volatile oils. You may notice that our culinary herbs are very often in this family. The family is very rich in aromatic principles that bring the flavor into the food. So very often the mint family is, is a predominant family in the kitchen. So thyme, it's the aerial parts that we're using, similarly to um, oregano, and you absolutely can use the flowers as much as you want to use the leaves. Very pretty sprinkled on a salad. Thyme and oregano both are profound antimicrobials. That is antibiotic, antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, and very, very potent. Um, so again, much like the sage, you can make your tea, you can use that as a mouthwash, you can drink it if you have some kind of gastrointestinal infection, if you've got um, eaten bad food, for example, sometimes if you're traveling, you don't always have control in the kitchen, this will be very useful. It can also be used as a skin wash for dirty cuts or minor infections, and thyme in particular, more so even than oregano, the volatile or essential oils, once you swallow them, are eliminated through the lung and the kidney. So they deliver the antimicrobial properties right into the lung and the kidney. So if you have a lung infection or you have a kidney infection, you want to make a tea of the thyme with the lid on, capturing those oils, and then drink it. And drink it fairly copiously. There's no really upper limit. Um, it tastes pretty strong, so that will be your limit. You'll reach a point where you don't want any more, but certainly a cup of that two or three times a day is a useful way to get medicine into the lungs or into the kidney. Now, if you don't like the taste or it's not convenient for some reason, you can also do an inhalation for lung infections. So with that, you can either purchase essential oil or you can simply harvest thyme or oregano chop it up, put it in a basin, pour on boiling water, and then put a towel over your head and inhale the steam. And what you're getting there is the volatile principles in the steam delivered right into the lung where the infection is. It's a very quick, very accurate, very targeted delivery mechanism. It works very, very well. Um, plus the steam loosens mucus, opens up the airways, warmth tends to open things up and relax muscles so that now you're able to cough more productively, your mucus is loosened up, your airways are wider, you can get stuff up and out. And in fact, those volatile principles might make you cough. And that's actually a good thing. In herbal medicine, we don't really do cough suppressing um, agents. There are a couple of herbs if you have a cough that's really troubling and not useful, but for the most part, we want you to cough. You come in with a cough, you're going to get medicines that make you cough more. And the reason for that is that the coughing is intentional for the body to clear stuff out. It's how the body is going to empty all that gunk out of the bottom of your lungs. So if you don't cough, you're going to prolong your lung congestion. You actually want that up and out. So the oils in the thyme and in the oregano will actually make you cough a little bit at the same time as making it an easier or a more free, more productive cough. Very, very useful. Okay, one more. I'm jumping around all over the place in my garden. Um, this is horseradish. Now, I grow quite a bit of horseradish, not exactly intentionally. I had some plants, I put them in a holding bed. A year later, I moved them where I thought I wanted them, and I ha cannot get rid of them from the holding bed. And now, of course, I, one year I wasn't there when it went to flower, and then it seeded out, and now I have little horseradishes in a number of beds, and it's very, very persistent. So I do actually go quite often pull the babies out because I'm trying to stop it from spreading. Um, horseradish is a pretty wonderful medicine. It's in the cabbage family. 
And of course, it is the root that we're using, that big tap root, and it can get really big. I've had mine a couple of feet long and several inches across. And um, what I do with that is I peel it. Well, first of all, I work with it outside, not in the kitchen because there are incredible fumes that come off it. So I do this outside, I'll peel it or scrub it. If it's, if, it's a fine, if it's a smaller root with a thin skin, I'll just scrub it. If it's a big one, I might peel it because it's tough. And then I shred it in the food processor. I do not do that by hand because I'd need some kind of gas mask to be able to do it. But in the food processor, it's quite manageable outside on the patio. And then I put that in Ziploc bags and I freeze it. And then I just take a handful of that out any time I want to put it into a casserole or a soup or a stir-fry or whatever. And freezing actually modulates the flavor. It's not quite as pungent and biting once it's been frozen. It definitely tastes strong, but it's not like biting into raw horseradish would be. There is one remedy that's using the raw horseradish. Um, it's pretty potent. You take a teaspoon of horseradish, shredded, and a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and chew them and it opens your sinuses. How many of you have had wasabi in the Japanese restaurants? Yeah. So you know how that can open up the sinuses and make you breathe. First of all, it makes you red, makes you stream a little bit and then all of a sudden your sinuses are totally clear and you can breathe and smell. So that is an, a remedy, a folk remedy for sinus congestion. It's not going to cure the problem. It's not going to stop you getting blocked up again the next day. But if you are really congested and it's uncomfortable, then a, ta a teaspoon of horseradish and a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. Sit down, put it in your mouth, and chew. Now, if you don't have fresh horseradish, you can actually use um, a jar of horseradish, prepared horseradish, which is just horseradish and vinegar. So all you really need to do there is take a spoonful of that and chew on it, and it will quickly open up your passages. But the other thing that's really exciting about horseradish, which is quite new research, is that um, it has a lot of compounds in it that stimulate the liver to clear toxins, in particular to clear out some of the estrogens that we're exposed to through our environment. So many things in our environment break down to give estrogen-like effects, plastics, especially soft plastics, many agricultural chemicals. When they um, get out into the water, into the soil, they have, and then into the foods, they have an estrogen-like effect in our body. And this is partly why we're seeing such a rise of estrogen-driven cancers today, which of course isn't just breast cancer. Estrogen drives prostate cancer, more so than testosterone. It drives melanoma. It drives bone cancer. It drives lung cancer. Lung cancer is the fastest growing cancer in women today, not because we're smoking more. In fact, we're smoking less than ever, but because of the estrogens in the environment that are feeding into that cancer. So horseradish helps to clear estrogens through the liver and out of the body. And the very, very best way is through the horseradish sprouts. And you're not likely to have those readily to hand on a daily basis. Um, they're quite pungent if you eat them. I mean, they're not unpleasant, but there's a limit. You're not going to eat masses of them. So that would be an opportunity to go to a capsule-type product where it's been dried and concentrated into the capsule. And that's definitely in my clinical practice when I'm working with cancer patients. Horseradish sprouts in a capsule is something I'm actually using quite a bit. The other thing that goes well there doing a very similar thing is broccoli sprouts. And again, you can buy broccoli sprouts in the grocery stores, but you'd have to eat a lot to get a therapeutic effect. So taking them in capsules, same family, it's the cabbage family. In fact, all your cabbage has this property to some extent. So every type of cabbage, your Brussels sprouts, um, you may not be aware of this, but kale, collards, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, red cabbage, green cabbage, they're actually all the same species of plant, but they've been selectively bred to appear very different, just like all dogs are the same species, you know, your Dachshund and your Great Dane are the same species, meaning that they can interbreed. So can all your cabbages. Um, you don't realize that when you're in the garden or the grocery store, they look so very different, but they're all actually the same plant. So they all have these sulfur compounds that help you to clear 
estrogens through the liver, and particularly found in the sprouts. So horseradish is a great favorite in our house. We use it quite liberally. Okay, another one. Now, I wonder if anyone can guess what this plant is. I mean, the Latin name is there, but Cynara scolimus. This is uh, artichoke. Let's go one more, David. Yeah, you recognize that, maybe. How many of you have eaten globe artichoke? Yeah. yeah. So, not my favorite, not a lot of people's favorites, because it's bitter. And that bitterness is the medicine. And the closer you get to the choke, the more bitter it is. So what you're actually eating, technically, botanically, is the bracts that wrap around the unopened flower. So let's go one more, David. Yeah, so there it is beginning to open. So you, that's gone too far for eating. Now it will just be tough and stringy. But if you get that unopened, effectively a flower bud is what you're eating. And it's in the thistle family, the daisy family. You probably guessed that. Um, when you, when you um, take off those bracts and eat the fleshy part and it is slightly bitter, you know how it's usually served as an appetizer? You're more likely to get your globe artichoke as a standalone dish as an appetizer section of the menu than you would have it as a side vegetable with your main meal. The reason for that is that when you eat bitter foods, they stimulate your whole digestive system. And they prep your digestive system for the coming food. So taking a bitter as an appetizer, taking a bitter food as an appetizer is a good way to prime the digestive system ready to receive the rest of the food and digest it better. So you taste bitterness in the mouth and it stimulates every aspect of your digestive system. So um, stomach acid production, the swallowing reflex, the peristalsis, the movement on through the system of foods, the, uh, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, everything gets kind of woken up by bitter foods. And we used to eat bitters in our diet. In fact, most of our leafy greens were very bitter originally, and we've gone through all the selective breeding to get rid of the bitterness because we don't like bitter. You know, we love sugar. We like salt. And sour is okay, especially if it's sweet and sour. But bitter, I mean, very few people, apart from some crazy herbalists, go out and choose to eat bitter foods on a regular basis. But an awful lot of people choose to take bitters without appreciating what they're doing. They'll drink a beer. Beer is made from hops. Hops are quite bitter. In fact, if you travel in Britain, you go to the pub, you order a pint of bitter. That's what beer is called. The dark beer is called bitter. And it's not usual to drink your beer after the meal. Traditionally, you would drink it before the meal. You might have Campari or a gin and tonic or a martini. Those are pre-dinner drinks, sort of in traditional use. And that's because they're all bitter. And as you're sipping on them, your digestive system is waking up and saying, oh, now I'm ready for the big meal. And I'm able to digest it better because of that. So we tend to have bitters before meals, and then those aromatic herbs after the meal for that carminative action to get all the contractions moving smoothly. So you might have, after your meal, you might have some of the sweet liqueurs, chartreuse, benedictine, stuff like that, which are full of aromatic herbs, the carminative herbs. Or if you go to an Indian restaurant, you get little fennel seeds at the end of the meal, or you might drink chai, or even in the ice cream, they put cardamom, and that's all the carminative action at the end of a meal. So back to the, the um, artichoke for a moment. One more picture, David. Yeah, here's a close-up. We rarely see it like this because we pick them before they're mature. We don't let them go to flower, but it is quite beautiful. I grow it an ornamental variety in the garden at the back of the herbaceous border because it gets to about six foot high and has a lot of these big, beautiful... Um, that flower head is as big as a saucer, and it's quite impressive. As a medicine, yes, you can eat it, um, but eat, eating that immature flower. But as a medicine, it tends to get processed from the leaf. The leaf is the most medicinal part. So that isn't necessarily something you're going to eat in your, 
in your home, but it is in the, in the world of herbal practice. We use extracts of artichoke leaf for um, the main use is to stimulate the liver to clear cholesterol. And it actually helps to drop your, your LDL and raise your HDL. So artichoke leaf extract is a phenomenal remedy for high cholesterol. And it not only brings down the bad stuff, but it actually brings up your good fats. So it changes the metabolism in the liver. It changes the way the liver makes and processes the, um, the cholesterol. So it's a really useful remedy. I certainly use it a lot in the clinic. Um, and I do encourage people to eat the vegetable, but again, you're not probably not going to get a therapeutic dose on a daily basis in that form. So that's where the extracts are useful. Okay, I have one more um, Western herb, and then we're going to jump continents. So let's have one more picture. Okay, this is celery. And I think I have one more of celery. Yeah, that's the celery leaf. Not the most dramatic picture, that one. But um, celery has uh, a couple of uses. If you take the juice of the plant, it's actually, of course, the stem of the leaf that technically that we're actually taking out as a vegetable. If you juice that, it's very, very detoxifying. It actually stimulates the kidney to flush. So if you're doing a detox, it's often used in spring cleansing. And it is especially useful at removing uric acid. And uric acid is what builds up around the arthritic joints. So celery juice is traditionally used for detoxification of arthritic joints. And that's something you can do at home. Of course, you can eat celery in your salads and as a, as a vegetable. But if you do make juices, or even if you make a smoothie in the morning, which seems to be a very popular thing these days, your smoothies should really have vegetables as much as fruits. You shouldn't have all fruit smoothies because you've got a whack of sugar that way. Yes, you've got fiber because it's whole fruit, not just juice. But it's still a lot of sugar. So ideally, you want to put some vegetables in that as well, some, something green. And your salary is particularly good, again, if you have arthritic joints. In the clinic, we actually use the seed as a medicine. So we make, have an extract of celery seed, and it's much more potent than the, than the stem, than the vegetable part. In the kitchen cupboard, in your spice cupboard, you may well have celery seed. Um, it's not at all uncommon. One of the things I like to do in my house is I make a product um, I used to have herbal medicine stores in Vancouver, and this was one of our best-selling products. I still make it myself now at home. It's called Stomach Settler Seed Sprinkle. And what it is, I get a, a salt grinder or a pepper grinder, and I put in a whole lot of aromatic seeds. So I put celery seed, caraway, coriander, black pepper, fennel, all sorts of different seeds from the cupboard, and I just grind, maybe a little bit of sea salt as well, and I just grind that fresh over my food as a condiment. So very, very delicious. When you grind it fresh, you're getting the volatile oils right there. If you, if you grind it and then put it in, the, in a container, you're going to start getting breakdown of the quality of it. But if you grind it fresh, so again, stomach, settler, seed, sprinkle. And I call it that because they're all those aromatic herbs and spices that are carminative, that soothe the digestive system, stomach, settler. Okay, let's switch continents a little bit. So these are some of the more exotic spices. Now, you know, people often ask me, what's the difference between a herb and a spice? And I'm going to tell you that it's just semantics. There really actually isn't a difference in the world of botany or in the world of herbal medicine. But historically, the herbs were leafy materials that were usually of Mediterranean origin. And the spices tended to be the barks or the roots or the seeds of plants that came from far, far away. So in the Elizabethan times and in the, uh, you know, three, four hundred years ago, they were the exotic imported. In fact, there was a, a, a time when black pepper was considered as valuable as gold. Um, it's probably more useful in some ways. You can't eat the gold. Um, we're going to talk about black pepper as our last um, slide, but let's just go to a couple of other things first. If you want to put the next one, David. This is ginger. 
I happen to love ginger. We use ginger a lot in our house. Um, ginger is a warming spice. It is the underground stems that we're using. You may think of it as ginger root, but in terms of botany, it's technically an underground stem. And it's very, very warming. It actually sends blood to the core of the body and then out to the hands and feet. So we use it for cold hands, we use it for cold feet, we use it for any impairment of the circulation. So things like smokers who get um, a condition of intermittent claudication, you can't get blood down into the legs properly, it opens up the blood vessels. Perhaps the most famous use or well-known use of ginger though is for nausea. And it really, really works. One more slide, David. Yeah, there's the flower of ginger. There was a study that was done in, um, I believe it was British Airways, one of the big, big airlines, um, probably about 20 years ago now, a long time back. And um, they took a bunch of, um, of pilots. And, you know, if you're piloting a plane, you definitely don't want to get motion sickness. It's definitely not a good idea. And I don't know if any of you get motion sickness, but I do. And you're pretty much out. You really couldn't be doing anything very useful like flying a plane. And you also can't take um, anti-nausea drugs because they make you drowsy. And that's not good either when you're flying that plane. So they took a bunch of volunteer pilots and gave half of them ginger and half, oh, sorry, one third ginger, one third uh, anti-nausea drugs, and one third placebo. And then they strapped them into flight simulators and span them around to see how long it would take before they threw up. Not a very nice experiment. But the outcome was very compelling. The ginger was substantially more effective than the drug with no drowsiness. So it was a double win. You know, not only more effective, but no side effects. So I absolutely use ginger now when I'm traveling. I'll make a big um, pot of ginger tea before I leave the house, and I'll drink that right up till I get to the gate, and they take your liquids away. <laughs> um, and then I often will take ginger tea bags and just ask for hot water on the airplane. Um, even chewing on crystallized ginger or Reed's ginger brew, you know, the ginger beer, with the real ginger beer, um, not the artificial flavor, but the one with real ginger extract, all of that. Um, so very warming, very good for nausea. It's also very, very useful as an antispasmodic in the abdomen. So if you have colic or crampy gut pain or menstrual cramps or any other abdominal cramping pain, um, I use it certainly even in cancer, abdominal cancers where there's a lot of spasmodic pain and it relaxes the muscles, draws blood into the pelvic area so it's very warming which is a relaxant to muscles. And hey, it tastes good. I've never had my patients complain about the teas with ginger in. They complain about a lot of my teas. But I put ginger in a lot of them to help them to enjoy the tea a little bit better. I'm not interested in having people suffer while they take their herbs. but not all the herbs taste great. So the ginger helps to get things down a little bit. All right, next picture. There it is. Ginger root, as you probably know it, but, but more correctly, it's an underground stem. Okay, one more. All right, now, this is the biggie. This is turmeric. And it's in the same family as ginger. Close cousin, actually. Looks very, very similar. You've probably seen um, pictures or maybe the, the root itself. Um, one more slide, David. Yeah, there it is, turmeric root, or stem, underground stem. Turmeric is probably one of the most heavily researched herbal medicines at the moment. Um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens, probably hundreds of research papers now about the medicinal use of turmeric. And in one word, it's an antioxidant. It is the preeminent antioxidant. Yes, that means anti-aging or, you know what, I don't like the language of anti-aging. What's actually, what's wrong with aging? I just want to age well. So let's talk about promoting longevity with this herb rather than preventing aging. You know, once you're on the other side of 50, talking about anti-aging gets a bit edgy. Like, what's wrong with it anyway? Let's just do it well. Let's be healthy as we get older. So turmeric is one of those herbs that brings oxygen into the body, that promotes cell health, 
profoundly anti-cancer. Let's go one more slide, David. Now, the coloring isn't great on that screen, but this is what we call the turmeric mandala. So what that is showing you is the active compound curcumin in the center and a whole slew of pathways in the cell that turmeric regulates. There's actually, at last count, 293 carcinogenic pathways that are moderated and regulated by turmeric. So, you know, cancer is a very smart thing. Um, if you put a drug in its way, it'll find a way around. It'll mutate, behave in different ways. So you block this pathway, it'll find something, some other way of getting where it wants to go. So the trick with herbal medicine, which the drug world can't do, is we have such multifactorial remedies. We have remedies that do lots of things all at once. So this is like ring fencing the cancer. When you put turmeric in the system, it's almost like the cancer doesn't have a way out. So it's antioxidant here and here and here and here and all around. And so it's extremely potent in managing cancer. And this slide is actually a little bit out of date now, but um, the fellow who does to develop this image is a researcher at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Agarwal. He's from India. And Dr. Agarwal is the world expert on turmeric. And he's a PhD, you know, cancer researcher. He's just come out with a book. It's brand new. It's called Healing Spices. And it's a book for the general public about all the different spices he's been researching and working with that have medicinal value. So it's called Healing Spices by Dr. Agarwal. And I love it because he's written it for regular folks who don't have PhDs in molecular biology. But he does have that. He does have that kind of background. So his research is impeccable. His facts are accurate. His references check out. It's a very, very useful book to bring his very highfalutin kind of research knowledge down into something that you can actually take home and use, that you can actually use in your kitchen. So um, again, the, the, the turmeric mandala is showing you just a, a sort of graphic idea of how many places turmeric works. So antioxidant with a special focus around um, um, healthy aging, and anti-cancer. And right now in my practice, it's one of the top two herbs I'm using in my, in my holistic oncology work. Um, turmeric is, has superseded many other herbs I thought was my favorite. <laughs> right now it's turmeric, turmeric, and more turmeric. The only downside with turmeric is if you actually take a lot of the root itself, it stains things orange. So it will stain your hands, and your cloths, and your counters, and eventually your teeth. So it is an opportunity perhaps to use a capsule, a little bit better compliance from people in the long term. And also the research was done on the super concentrates, which is what's in the capsules. And if you simply take the root and cook it up in dishes like ginger, or if you take the powder and use it in your food, it's hard to get enough. It has a fairly strong taste, and it's hard to get enough um, to really have a therapeutic effect. So then you go to a product. But you know what? That could get expensive. If you're taking products long term, and if you're talking about healthy aging, we could be talking about 20 years of use. That's going to get expensive fast. So at that point, what you want to do is go to a store and in bulk and buy a pound of turmeric powder and cap it up yourself at home. You can buy empty capsules, sit watching your favorite TV show and cap it up. You can even buy a little sort of $20, $25 little capping machines. Very, very simple. Um, and then you want to take somewhere between four and six capsules a day will give you a reasonably therapeutic dose for baseline, not for treating big disease, but just as a good preventative. Four or six capsules a day of plain turmeric powder will actually give you a fairly substantial dose. And that's not difficult to do, and that's not expensive if you do it yourself. OK, I have two more slides, or two more plants to look at. Cinnamon. 
I had the great good fortune in my 20s of spending some time living in Sri Lanka, and cinnamon was one of the key crops. I mean, they do a lot of really lovely aromatic spices there, but in the village that I lived, um, cinnamon was a very major crop, and the whole air just smelled of cinnamon the whole time. It was really lovely. They strip the bark, and then they spread it out to dry, and as it's drying, the volatile compounds are coming out, and you're able to smell that. So let's look at the next picture. Yeah, this is cinnamon flower. Now, obviously, this isn't something you're going to have growing in your garden or see very often. I suppose if you lived way down south in Florida, perhaps you might be able to grow cinnamon. Um, it's certainly a tropical plant, but if you have any frost or any, you know, f sort of cold nights, you'd have to be protecting it. Um, you could certainly grow it in an unheated greenhouse um, in the southern parts of, of the U.S. Um, so again, it's the bark that we're using, and cinnamon has a number of properties. It's very warming, so a little bit like ginger, it sends blood out to the hands and the feet and into the pelvis so that if you have crampy discomfort, menstrual cramps, colic, cinnamon is very useful. It's again carminative, so it regulates those contractions of the gut a little bit. Um, it's a very potent antimicrobial, an antiseptic, and it's being used a bit like rosemary. It's being used in food preservation now. And perhaps the most interesting thing about cinnamon at the moment, let's have one more slide, David. Yeah, there's the leaf. The most interesting research on cinnamon bark right now is for managing blood sugar. And it's extremely effective at lowering blood sugar. So if you are prone to high blood sugar, if you're on the edge of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, this would be very safe, very delicious. Just add cinnamon to everything that you can. So um, powdered cinnamon is effective if it's been stored well. Of course, as soon as you're powdering things, you're exposing that surface area, you might start to get loss of volatile compounds. But um, Again, you can purchase cinnamon extract, or if you buy the whole twigs, the whole bark, then you can grind that yourself in a coffee grinder, just a small amount at a time, so it's very, very fresh. Sprinkle it onto your oatmeal, put it into your curries, put it into any dish you can, even, again, making a tea with it. Um, very, an again, antimicrobial, digestive soothing, warming, and most particularly for blood sugar balance. And I have one more plant to talk about before we go to questions. Oh, that's the cinnamon again. One more, David. Pepper. This time, two years ago, I had the great good fortune to be invited to go to India with a, um, a film crew who were making a, a documentary film about tribal people and their herbal medicines. And it took a year to get the permits to go into the villages because they were so remote and isolated. They were sort of like going to the reservation. Those people were actually considered, quote, protective, primitive, protected primitive people. That was the term. I'm not sure they appreciated that. But they, they had land which they were farming in a very subsistence manner, but they were not allowed to sell that land. Um, they were mostly illiterate. Um, some of the tribes that we filmed with, one of the tribes had only 1,500 members in the whole tribe, and they only spoke their own language. They had their own costumes, um, their own handicrafts that nobody else had. So definitely threatened populations. In the 14 villages that we filmed, in several different climates, from, from higher in the mountains down into the, into the hot plains, as we got down into the lower elevations, we found a lot of cinnamon, uh, sorry, of uh, pepper in their villages. And it was a very, very um, important medicine for them. They were proud to show us their pepper vines. It is a vine. And um, it's, of course, the fruit or the berry that we're using as a medicine. There are, in the grocery stores, you can buy the green peppercorns. Those are picked unripe and then pickled or dried to stop them ripening after they've been picked. You can get the white peppercorns, which have gone to maturity, but then they are peeled, mechanically peeled. Or you can get the classic black peppercorn, which is harvested at full maturity and just allowed to dry. There's no real processing. So as a medicine, that would be the preferred kind. 
And pepper is a very interesting medicine. How many of you have pepper in your home? Okay. How many of you use pepper on your dish, on your, on your food? Good. Because it's a really useful medicine. How many of you take supplements? Vitamins, minerals. Okay. So those of you that do, go home tonight and have a look on the bottle on the label. And very often you'll see the last ingredient, which means the least amount in the bottle. The last ingredient is something called bioperine. Bioperine is an extract of black pepper. It's actually an extract from the volatile or essential oil of black pepper. And it increases the absorption of all your nutrients. So that's why it's put into your supplements. And that's why it's good to put it on your food. If you grind fresh black pepper on your food, note, grinding the fresh black pepper, not purchasing it pre-ground, you have all those volatile compounds coming out of the fresh ground seed, and, um, and it slightly irritates the stomach lining, just enough to get more blood supply into that tissue, which enhances absorption of nutrients. If you look at traditional uses of condiments, with foods, they often do things like that. So, um, you know, the mint sauce with your roast lamb or the horseradish with your roast beef, those are, or my mom used to put cloves into the um, roast pork. She used to, you know, score the skin and put the cloves in. All of those are carminative and they help you digest those fatty, rich meats. Um, so, putting black pepper on your food whatever the dish, is going to enhance the nutrient absorption. You're going to get more bang for your buck. You're going to get more nutrition out, just like you get more nutrition from your supplement. You're going to get more out of your, out of your dinner if you put the black pepper on. And again, fresh ground, because if you purchase pre-ground, guess what? All those volatile compounds have dissipated, and it doesn't have the same strength. And black pepper is better than white pepper for the same reason, because it's less processed. So in the drying of the white pepper, it actually loses a lot of its medicinal value. So black pepper, simple black pepper, everybody has black pepper, every restaurant has black pepper, and it's a medicine. So this is why I get so excited about the whole concept of food as medicine. You're doing it every day. You have to eat three times a day. Well, maybe twice sometimes, but you have to eat every day. So you might as well look for things that give you not just your basic vit or, you know, vitamins, minerals, proteins, calcium, that kind of you know, carbohydrates, the standard stuff, but think a little bit bigger than that. Think about your food as a medicine, not just as nutrition. And uh, in my clinical practice, patients come to me often very ill, often in a long-term treatment strategy, and often with budget restrictions. Um, we do have socialized health care in Canada. What that means is everybody gets health care, but nobody gets very good care. Um, there just ain't enough to go around. So I'm not sure it's better or worse than what you have here, but I think it behooves all of us to take care of our own health ourselves, starting with our dinner plate, so that we don't have to go and seek help as much or as often. Um, yes, we want to have doctors and hospitals for crisis interventions, but um, if we could all eat a little bit healthier, we'd probably not need to spend as much on our health care. And um, putting lots of herbs and spices into your food is, in my opinion, almost as important as having good food to start with. It's all part of the same mix. So I hope that I've um, whetted your appetite for herbal medicine, um, and I hope that I have given you some tools to go home with and actually feel like when you open that cupboard now, Think about all the ways you can use those herbs and spices that you've not been using. Oh, and by the way, if you've not been using them for quite a while and they've been sitting there in the back of the cupboard, opened, unused, you know what? Dump them. Start over. You should be changing over your herbs and spices every three to six months. And you should buy them in the whole form if you can and grind them yourself when you need them because they're much more nutritious that way. And um, buy small amounts often. This is not a time to save money by buying huge, big bulk, because they don't keep. You want to rotate those. So smaller amounts, 
rotate them in the kitchen, keep them in a cool, dark place, keep them in a sealed container. I transfer everything into jam jars so I can do the lid up tight, no air. Cool, dark cupboard, not in that rack over the top of the stove. It's a terrible place to keep your herbs and spices. And, um, and again, buy whole spices and herbs if you can and grind them or chop them as you want to use them, and grow them. You have a fabulous climate for growing a lot of these things. And there's nothing like going out to the garden and picking the fresh herbs and bringing them in. Absolutely nothing like that. Just as it is the same, that tomato fresh off the vine, still warm, it does taste different. Yeah. So I am going to draw to a close with the, the official presentation. David, I have one more slide I want you to stick up there, though before you, you, he's come downstairs, but I need him to run back up and okay. just hit the last okay. slide. Oh, no, you're on it. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you'd done it. Oh, he's <laughs> ahead of me. All right. So um, I'm going to take questions. We do have a mic, mic, which David will, if you raise your hand, David will give you the mic so everybody can hear the question, and it will get onto the tape. Um, we do have some notes from the talk tonight, so if you want to get those notes, please go to the website um, MotherEarthWorks.com, which is um, David's website for Mother Earth Foods, and you can, um, they're not loaded yet, I've just given them to him today, but in the next week or so, you'll be able to access those notes and print them and bring them, you know, pull them in for yourself. Um, it's a text document, it's not the pictures, it's actually text about some of the things that we talked about and a couple of others as well. So do we have any questions out here? Yeah, we've got one over here. Earlier you were speaking about the garlic, and most recently I bought a huge big bag of garlic cloves at Sam's and thought, oh, I'm not going to leave this in, you know, in the bottom of the fridge, I'm going to do things with it. So I put some in oil, some in vinegar, some, you know, in different things. But you said um, use it in two to three weeks. Yeah, the reason I suggested that you use up your garlic is actually in the, in the vinegar or the oil, you should be absolutely fine. I would keep them in a cool, dark place. Um, don't let the temperature change too much. A fridge would actually be ideal. I had one bad experience with the honey when I used very, very fresh garlic that was only dug a few days. And I think it had too much moisture in and it reduced the sugar volume of the, of the or sugar content of the honey down. It diluted the honey and the whole thing exploded. And I had garlic honey to hell. <laughs> I mean, I do literally mean exploded. It, it blew the top off. The, I had it in a big quart jar and it blew the top. And um, yeah, that wasn't a nice experience. So, so actually, perhaps what I should say there is when you purchase garlic, it's been out of the ground for weeks at least, and it's dried off a bit. So if you've dug garlic fresh in the garden, set it aside for two or three weeks or a month or so before you work with it. That's all. Yeah. No, I, I, the, the question was, you have to heat the vinegar. Um, my recipe books all said bring the vinegar to boiling point. Now, I'm not going to tell you that what you've done is useless or, or not safe. I would just say it probably won't have as good a keeping quality, so you may want to use it up more quickly and certainly keep it in the fridge. And failing that, stick it in the freezer. Pour it off into small containers, like maybe into ice cube trays, freeze those, and then drop them into Ziploc bags for storage in the freezer, and then you can, I do a lot, I puree a lot of stuff and put it in ice cube trays to freeze, and then put those into the freezer in a Ziploc, and you just pull out a cube or two when you want it. Yeah. The other thing that we do with our huge amount of garlic that we harvest, it doesn't keep forever. So we have garlic peeling parties, and we put on some kind of audio lecture from a conference or something. We get a bunch of friends who are interested in a herbal topic and we put an audio on and we peel like crazy and then we freeze those. Other questions? BJ. I just, um, it's so, so overwhelming of all these properties and so on. How do you maintain a balance uh, dosage or 
in food eating. I don't know how you can uh, balance these herbs and spices. Yeah. So the question is, how do, we, how do we manage with so many options and so, so much stuff in there? How do we know how much to have? You know, I, I think I can answer it two ways. One is the common sense of healthy eating, what, what goes well in the kitchen. And so recipes that call for herbs and spices, there's kind of proportions in there that are generally going to be tasty, maybe not quite enough to give you a therapeutic dose, but certainly every little bit helps. The other aspect is if you're actually sick, then you're going to need to do something a bit more. So um, you might have your favorite recipes that you cook on a, you know, on a regular basis, but when you get sick, you might step it up to the, you know, the, the recipe with more garlic or more ginger. So perhaps I could best answer it by saying that um, in terms of herbal medicine and safety, when can you use herbs, how much can you use, when should you not use them? I think the rule of thumb is if you have a condition that you would normally go to your doctor to get advice about before embarking upon any treatment, then, and you don't want to do drugs, then you should go talk to a herbalist. But if you have the kind of condition that you would walk into the drugstore and self-select a remedy off the shelf, or even ask the pharmacist for a little bit of advice. Those things you can treat yourself at home with herbs. You need some good books, maybe a few classes, um, but it's that common sense. If I would treat it myself anyways, then I would treat it with herbs instead of pharmaceuticals. But if I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what the condition is, I don't know how to approach it, and I need advice, then I would say go to a herbalist if you don't want to go to your physician. Um, these days, of course, many physicians are opening their minds to this as well, and you're getting some crossover. Or they phone David, <laughs> um, you know, to ask about, my patients come in and they want to take turmeric, and is this safe, and how much should they take? And they'll phone an expert like David to get that information. So either way, it's, it's a common sense thing about what you would do, um, well, regardless of whether it's a herb or a drug, that would be kind of the, the dividing line. And for the most part, the herbs are safe. There are very, very rare cases. You know, the, the herbs you have in your kitchen are all generally safe. There are poisonous herbs, and we do use poisonous herbs in a clinical practice, but those are not the ones that you're keeping in your spice cupboard at home. So if it's in the spice cupboard at home, it's pretty safe. Yeah. Others? Yeah. I read recently that um, cilantro is very good for cleating mercury, mm -hmm. but I'm not crazy about <laughs> cilantro. Will yeah. coriander do the same thing since it's from the same plant? Will which? Coriander. Coriander. Well, coriander is the seed of the cilantro plant. And no, the seed will not pull mercury out the way the leafy material does. It is true that coriander pulls mercury and copper out of the body. Black beans do it as well. So black bean salsa with fresh coriander is actually pretty good medicine. But the seed will not do that. No, sorry to disappoint you. And can you speak about dandelions? Oh, I can speak about dandelion. For a long time. Yeah, for a long time. Well, dandelion is, is again one of those herbal medicines that crosses the food medicine line because people eat dandelion greens and you can make kind of a coffee substitute out of the root, but it is also a medicine. So if you want to make a coffee substitute, you need to pick your roots in the fall. And that's the voice of experience because roots are usually harvested spring or fall because in the summer, all the energy of the plant is above ground and the roots are t tend to be quite small and they're just a conduit. They're not storing anything in the, in the summer. So normally you'd pick roots of any plants, spring or fall, but in dandelion, it, um, it lays down a lot of sugars through the summer that are then used up through the winter to keep the plant alive, ready to grow for the spring. So you want to get your roots in the fall because they're sweeter, they're bigger, and they're also a little bit sweeter. The, the spring roots are very bitter. The fall roots are marginally bitter. And then you roast them, chop them, roast them, and grind them and make a coffee. Yeah. Um, the leaf is eaten as a green vegetable. 
Uh, the commercially available ones in the grocery store are a special cultivar that's not so bitter as the wild ones, but we already talked about bitters. Bitters are good medicine. So dandelion greens from your garden will be bitter, and you're not going to have the whole salad of that, but in your, a little bit of it in your juice, in your smoothie, or some leaf in the salad is actually very, very good for you. The root is also somewhat bitter. The leaf tends to work a little bit more on the gallbladder, um, so if you're prone to um, gallbladder congestion, not active stones, but just if you, if you don't tolerate fatty, rich foods well, you get a little bit of an upset, a little bit nauseous, a little bit uncomfortable in your upper right area here, then maybe dandelion leaf is useful. Dandelion root is a little bit more of a bowel stimulant. So it's not actually a laxative, but it's heading that way. So it just so it softens the stool, gets you going a little bit more easily in the morning. So as a food, you're taking um, usually a cultivar that's not quite so medicinal. Um, and of course, if you're making the coffee and you put cream and sugar and all of that, it's not quite so medicinal. But herbalists use dandelion leaf and dandelion root as medicines quite a lot. The leaf is also diuretic, so it's quite useful for water retention. Um, the only thing I would caution you with dandelion is to make sure that you know what's been sprayed where, it's, where you're picking because it's on lawns and, you know, it's considered a weed, so it's quite often sprayed. So if it's your lawn and you know that your lawn doesn't do drugs, then you're fine to pick. But, oh, I have a bumper sticker that says my lawn doesn't do drugs. Actually, we don't really have a lawn, but, um, but I have the sticker anyway. That's great. But if, but if you're picking it on your neighbor or somewhere that you don't know the... the treatment of that land. Be careful. Yeah. All right. One couple, couple more. I got one up here. Okay. Uh, can you address um, the combination of some drugs that complement each other? The combination of drugs or of I, herbs? I meant herbs. <laughs> I've heard the word drug before. With yeah. Combinations of herbs. Yeah. I mean, in the kitchen, obviously it's a flavor profile. So you're going to look for complementary flavors. Um, some of you may have heard of the concept in perfumery of your base note, your middle note, and your top note. And you can think of that in your kitchen as well. Your base notes are going to be the deeper, richer flavors, the ones that linger the longest. Maybe you're not the first thing you taste in the food, but but come out a little bit later. Um, they tend to be the more resinous plants, the roots, the barks. The top notes are going to be the very first thing that you notice when you taste something or smell something. It's usually a lighter, more floral, more uplifting. So just in terms of flavor combinations, um, that's one way to think of it in the same idea as, of perfumery, to kind of create a spectrum. But in terms of medicine, you combine things according to the need of the individual. So, um, of course, in, you know, again, in the kitchen, there's traditional combinations of things that are put together. Um, but, but in terms of medicine, we would try to assess what the need is in that individual and then come up with a customized program that might be partly food-based and partly therapeutic use of herbs, whether that's in the food or taken separately. But that is the uh, four years of study that a beginner herbalist, herbal practitioner does. So um, a, a qualified herbalist has trained for um, a minimum of two years full time, and usually it's up to four years of, of training before you're launched into the public, into the unsuspecting public. Um, and so that's what we're learning. It's, we're learning the science. Yes, we learn the constituents and how to extract things. And we learn medicine and how to evaluate the body. But we also learn the art. And the art is an intangible skill. I can't define it and I can't tell you what it is. But it's a bit like a chef in the kitchen. You've got your day-to-day -day family cook that can put a decent meal on the table and everybody's happy. And that's maybe more like your sort of lay herbalist. And then you've got your fine chef, you know, the, the artist in the kitchen, and that might be more the equivalent of the herbal practitioner. All very valid, 
Um, there's nothing wrong with a good basic home cooked dinner. You know, your steak and kidney pudding is pretty good food. That's the Brit in me, of course. Um, but, uh, but, you know, chicken pot pie, whatever it is, it's just routine, standard mom's fare. Nothing wrong with that. But then if you want to go to the fine cuisine, you either go to a restaurant or you take some cooking classes. So it's that, you know, with, for a herbalist, it's that kind of dance between what's affordable, what's palatable, what's available, what season are we in, what climate are we in, and what's the issue for this person and how big of a medicine do they need. Because sometimes just doing it in food isn't enough. Sometimes, you know, big disease takes big medicine. So you have to kind of make a judgment call there about how much somebody needs. Yeah. Um, when you was talking about uh, horseradish, you only mentioned the root. I only mentioned the root of horseradish because um, the leaf is quite unpalatable. The leaf definitely is pungent, but it's very bitter as well, and it's also very tough. It's not nice to use. I do, however, harvest the flowers because I'm desperate to stop it spreading now. Anytime I accidentally, you know, I've let some get as far as flowering, I cut the flowering stalk and then I pinch off the individual flowers and sprinkle them onto salads. Mm -hmm. Now, how, is, how are the flowers? The flowers are pungent. Pungent. They and they pungent smell too. pungent. You walk through the garden and you can smell when it's in bloom. Good. Yeah, and they taste fine. They taste like mild horseradish, and they're really pretty. I'm all about edible flowers. I actually grow an edible flower garden because we sell edible flowers to a couple of fancy restaurants in the town, and uh, the horseradish flowers are actually very popular. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chen Chow. We appreciate your sharing with us this evening, and uh, we're going to be here for just a few moments, so I'm sure people might have some Personal questions. I'm also about. doing David's radio show tomorrow, so if you have a burning question that you didn't ask or you think of in the middle of the night, phone us. Or call us and talk yeah. to us, because somebody else has probably got the same question. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I have a few business cards down here. David, of course, has his business cards as well. 